Good evening, blog viewers. We're going to continue with the um, <clears throat> self-creation post. I've been looking at that um, probably over the past few weeks, and uh, we're going to continue with Kohut today. Um, we talked about Kohut. Obviously, he's one of the um, founders of the self-psychology movement uh, with the emphasis on uh, the formation of a strong, what's uh, referred to as a nuclear self, and the importance of getting that project done correctly and its sort of central importance in, in a broad human life all the way through adulthood. Um, and so a lot of his writings have obviously, self-psychology, been very, uh, have uh, sort of dovetailed nicely with uh, our series here on self-creation. And, uh, and so before getting into COVID more, um, uh, I want to talk about, obviously in the blog we talk a lot about uh, you know, science, and we've been talking about unwritten realities, one of the terms we've been using a lot, um, and the universe in general. And I want to talk, start out by talking a little bit about um, some very basic facts about the universe. Um, only if an object reaches a certain mass um, and does it become uh, spherical uh, in, in the cosmos. And only then does it have a center of gravity. Uh, all stars, planets, uh, all, all moons basically have this spherical structure. Uh, they, they reach a certain point of mass, they become spherical, and as a result of that they have uh, a center of gravity with all, all vectors uh, of gravity pointing toward the center. Now these objects, the sun, the moon, all the planets are constantly in a state of motion. Um, the Earth itself is moving at about 18 miles per second. Um, but in the course of all this motion, in the course of all this constant uh, fast motion, it's always retaining uh, its center of gravity. That's not changing in that sense. It's moving, uh, the center of gravity is moving, but the actual gravitational force is the same. The, uh, the uh, buoyancy of water on, on the Earth remains the same. Um, uh, the uh, various, you know, physical laws remain the same. So those things are, so there's a lot of uh, constants, even despite a very a changing planet, a changing uh, creatures that live on the planet and all those other things. Um, but when an object has a center of gravity, um, basically what happens is it pulls everything toward its center. Um, uh, and that you can see that on the Earth. If you drop anything, you'll You'll, feed, you'll see the force of gravity pulling, you know, with all its, literally the entire force of the Earth is pulling on, um, you know, whatever object you throw. And uh, the only reason that, uh, and, it's, and it's pulling uh, that object toward the center of the Earth. And so the only reason that we are literally not right now at the center of the Earth is because uh, whatever we're standing on, the ground for most people, um, or you know uh, the home that's you know laid over the ground is preventing us from falling any further. That sort of stops the. Uh, the but otherwise, we would be you know right at the center. Um, as opposed to now, those are that discussion is basically about stars and and planets and moons. Now, as opposed to planets, stars, and moons that are spherical and have the center of gravity. Uh, asteroids and other sort of debris in the cosmos, uh, uh, they don't, uh, they're not uh, spherical and they don't have a center of gravity. Uh, they're in motion and, but they're being pulled by other objects, by other gravitational forces, and uh, they aren't big enough to have their own center of gravity and pull things toward it, uh, and so they tend to basically just drift and collide with other things uh, in some act of destruction. Uh, some, some, some people think that dinosaurs were wiped out by uh, <clears throat> an asteroid, is one theory. Um, but anyway, uh, so they tend to collide in some act of destruction, and, and they're done. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so that's basically the two types of things you see uh, that you can, objects of that sort, uh, mass, 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 mass type objects that, that you see out there. Uh, and so can we... Can we sort of learn anything uh, from this, uh, from this discussion of what seems to be something very different and very dissimilar to the human self, um, or is it is it completely separate, totally 
different sphere. Uh, I don't think so. I think we can actually learn some things from from this sort of discussion. And you could say, in a sense, uh, the self, the human self, is is also uh, uh, constantly changing or should constantly change. Um, but it's also fixed, um, uh, and uh, and it probably should have its own center of gravity. So should change. Uh, because life changes, because environmental factors change, and for many other reasons we've discussed and, and we'll get into more. Um, and, but it's fixed in another sense, the self is fixed, and again, it should have its own center of gravity. So that's sort of what I'd like to talk about for the remaining time. And where it lacks these things, I think, similar to the asteroid example, it's sort of, the self sort of drifts all over, uh, like the asteroid, never able to really take control of itself, uh, constantly conflicting with other people, um, constantly getting into sort of altercations and, and uh, you know, causing havoc, and in the end, accomplishing very little. That's good. Um, so let's unpack this. There's a lot of, a lot of luck going on there. Uh, why is the self, how could we say that the self is fixed? Well, the DNA is fixed. Um, DNA is what, again, is what distinguishes us from, you know, the mosquito that's somewhere probably in this room. Uh, it's the, the, the letters in the DNA is, is, is what makes us us we, uh, in, as a species, in humans and individual people has, have their specific characteristics, why people have certain eye color and other things. Um, so that's fixed though at birth. That doesn't change um, at all. Uh, it's beyond doubt. Um, uh, you don't, can't change your DNA. Yeah, it doesn't evolve during your life. And uh, you don't choose your DNA. You don't choose. Uh, you don't choose your parents. Um, you don't choose the fact that they decide to have parents. And uh, so that's that's uh, that DNA will be in every one of your cells in your body, and it's going to be the same throughout your entire life. Um, in general, and that's that's for a specific person. Now, in general, I think human DNA overall has not changed much. It, <laughs> in totality, in the past uh, three thousand years, I think uh, that's sort of one uh, one other interesting fact. I don't have a site for it, but uh, but I will at some point. Um, but the point is, so there is there's a self that has a fixed DNA. The species in general has largely a fixed DNA, and this all acts as a sort of fixed constraint on life. Uh, you know, we can't fly. Humans can't fly because we, unlike birds because we don't have the DNA that would allow us to do that. We don't have the, uh, we can fly in an airplane, we can create a tool, but we can't do it ourselves. Uh, and it's because we don't have, you know, the, the DNA that would facilitate that. And we didn't have it 3,000 years ago, and we don't have it now. Um, so, uh, again, the centrality, the, the fixed nature of the self through the DNA. Um, I think the self is also fixed in that it has to abide by some pretty basic laws, uh, some so. You know, self-preservation being the most important. No one can say, you know, I don't want to eat or drink or breathe air. Uh, you know, these are fixed constraints. You can't do anything about it. You have to constantly tend to it. Um, you have no choice. You have to keep doing these things. And that's another sort of fixed limitation on the self. But beyond those things, beyond um, those fixed limitations, I think um, we could also say, you know, the self, the human self has the potential of constantly changing itself, constantly overcoming itself, constantly um, putting itself in a position to have new experiences, uh, constantly placing itself in new environments. Um, and that thing is, uh, and that's sort of a part of the DNA too, it's that, um, you know, part of the DNA is to have a mind that uh, that allows you to think and reflect and, and put yourself in a position to have different experiences. Um, uh, and, and new experiences, um, and so that's that's sort of part of our uh, ability too. But does that now see? I don't I don't think that resolves the issue entirely though. Uh, what is it? Uh, newness, you know, constantly having new experiences for the sake of having new experiences is not the point. Um, I think those people and organizations, or in general anyone that um, does does well in a very broad sense, not just successful, but does well are those people that embrace, you know, uh, sort of good newness in their life and reject bad newness. Uh, they get the distinction right as to good and bad newness. 
and they make the correct decision as to embracing good newness and ignoring or rejecting bad newness. Not all the time, they don't get it always right, but most of the time they get it right. So imagine if there was like a new religion that sprang up where the central tenet was the worship of whiteout. Uh, that would be an example of, I would say, bad newness. You know, we should embrace it just because it's new. Why not? Because it's irrational. There's no point uh, to uh, worshiping whiteout. It's silly. And uh, one of the values that we should have is obviously the pursuit of rational beliefs of, of what what has at least a reasonable likelihood of creating some good outcome for us. And and even under that very broad metric, the worship of whiteout would not fit within that criteria. So where does the idea of newness come from then? Where does, how do we come up with, we've got fixed DNA, fixed limitations, fixed requirements we have to abide by. Um, where does this newness come from? And, uh, and uh, I think it has to come again from the mind. Uh, the heart, again, there's a lot of misconceptions about the heart, I think. The heart, you know, in contemporary culture is viewed as this uh, originator of, of, you know, love and, and, and other things um, and, and certain actions and caring actions and stuff. The heart is a muscle that pumps blood. Um, it doesn't do any of those things. That's been sort of grafted on sort of within popular culture. The heart is not doing those things. Um, the knees are not doing those things. Uh, the bones are not coming up with ideas. Um, you know, uh, it, you can think of other body parts. Your hair is not doing that. These these body parts all have very finite uh, biological chemical functions that there are that they're executing. The heart is a good example. Is pumping blood. And uh, the knees are, you know, doing what they're doing, and the bones, same. But they're not coming up with ideas of how you should live. And they shouldn't be thought of as, uh, ever, as, as being the originators of, of those kinds of ideas. And so you're left with the mind. So the mind is actually, uh, human brain is, is, I was reading some facts about it, and it's literally an astonishing um, organ, I would say the least. Um, and I would argue it's well equipped to to create newness, uh, more than well equipped. Um, here are some facts about the brain I was able to pick up pretty quickly. Um, only two percent of human body mass uh, comprises the brain, but it uses twenty percent of human energy of the human energy we consume. Uh, but even at two percent, it's actually a very large portion of the entire human body as compared to other animals. Um, uh, comparatively, um, the brain has uh, human brain has a hundred billion neurons. Hundred billion. The octopus, in comparison, has three hundred million. Uh, a bee has about a million. Uh, so uh, you can see sort of there in the evolutionary development where a human being is compared to other animals. Interestingly, other other animals are actually more much more developed than us in some of their sensual. Capacities. Uh, the average dog, as any any dog owner will know, has a very good sense of smell. Um, the average dog has about one billion cells devoted to smell, um, while humans have only twelve million cells devoted to smell. So you see again, the the brain of the human is is uniquely powerful, um, uniquely uh, uh, infinite, really, um, as compared to other animals. Um, the synapses between these, so there's a hundred billion neurons, but each neuron has about 1,000 to 10,000 synapses that it can connect. And so that again increases the potential of the mind. Um, so in general, I think it's almost undeniable based on facts that the mind is an incredibly powerful organ uh, in the human body. Uh, I think again, as we've talked about in some of the other posts, the mind at birth is probably open to a lot of different configurations and harnessings and wiring of these neurons and synapses in, in many different forms. Um, it all depends on what you learn, what you do, what you experience over the years um, that results in a certain you know orientation of your mind and certain configuration of the mind. Um, and this can always be changed, but I think it takes a lot of effort uh, to do that. Um, so with those those comments, I want to turn to, and in light of those comments, I want to look at some of 
Kovitz's remarks on self-creation in some of his essays here. The essays um, we're going to look at again are in the book uh, Self-Psychology and the Humanities. Um, and uh, I think uh, three points really deserve emphasis. Uh, one is that uh, this self-creation project, is, is whether you want to call it creating a nuclear self, um, creating a, some other sort of self, whatever it is, but but for him it was creating the nuclear self, uh, which he distinguished between sort of um, the self of convenience or sort of a, a secondary self that sort of you just sort of use as to get by in life or to get by in certain situations or to sort of make do. Like imagine, you know, someone in law school, you know. Uh, I think Kohut would say, you know, the personality you're going to adopt in law school to get through is probably not your nuclear self. It's not your stable, I mean, it's not your unique essence. It's just really the self that you've kind of need to get through that experience. And, and you can think of that in terms of different different areas too. Um, but, but but then there is this thing for COVID of the nuclear self. And that is, for him, one of the most important things that you tap into it, that you know what it is, that you develop it, that you grow it, that you appreciate it, and all those things. And that becomes, for him, sort of the most central project of life, project of therapy or a project of uh, any sort of psychological understanding of yourself. And uh, so he stresses over and over again how important this, this project is, and he does so in light of some comments about basically um, the modern specialization of labor and how, how what that is doing to the self. And I want to read some of, some of his remarks. This is in The Self in History, page 163. And uh, COVID writes here, Most of us have intentionally put on blinders and narrowed our sights in consequence of our commitment to our professions. We want to understand our craft and to work in it as best we can, and beyond that, we don't want to look. He continues on, Each individual must refine and work out a new kind of psychological life, a new kind of meaningful existence, by expanding his inner skills and his inner powers. Um, he says later on page one, on uh, sorry, page eleven, um, uh, the nuclear self uh, is not immutable. The task of modifying and even of transforming it is repeatedly imposed on us throughout life, under the influence of new internal external factors. The modifiability of the nuclear self is not a sign of disease, and must not, in and of itself, be evaluated as a psychological or moral defect. On the other hand, we may justifiably deplore some behavior as the manifestation of a psychological shortcoming and a moral infirmity. Uh, he goes on, such behavior does not involve an alteration of the nuclear self, but represents merely an adaptation on the psychological service. In such individuals, the nuclear self ceases to participate in the overt attitudes and actions and becomes progressively isolated and is finally repressed or disavowed. The psychological outcome, which is unfortunately more or less characteristic of the psychological makeup of the majority of adults, is not an individual striving toward a creative solution of his conflicts concerning the redefinition of his basic ambitions and values, but a person who, despite his smoothly adaptive surface behavior, experiences a sense of inner shallowness and who gives to others an impression of artificiality. So that is a person, I think, for COVID that... Um, that has not moved beyond sort of the secondary self and the sort of the adapt, adaptable self that's sort of adapting to different situations as, as needed through life. And uh, again, COVID sees that as a huge problem and sees that as a problem that he says, to quote him, unfortunately, unfortunately characterizes the psychological makeup of the majority of adults. Then on 74, he says, um, he writes on page 74, um, <clears throat> The child whose self is stunted by the self-object's failures is in his depression mourning an unlived, unfulfilled future. Each moment of experience is decisive in determining whether some suffering and depression may be in essence a step toward ultimate fulfillment or sterile, sterile and thus part of a tragic failure. Experience can only be evaluated against the assessment of the total course of a creative and productive or non-creative sterile life cycle. So in these comments, all three... I think you see COVID sees self-creation as sort of a do it, do it or lose it kind of thing. There's really nothing else. There's no, you know, there's nothing, there's no, you can't sort of stay neutral on the issue. You either do it 
and you form your nuclear cell and uh, you reap what for COVID seems to be a lot of the benefits from doing that, um, or you don't do it and you're stunted and you're limited and you're held back as a result. And you just constantly keep using different secondary and adaptive selves to adapt to whatever whatever environment is going to happen to, uh, you know, pop up in a certain day or week or even hour. And you just constantly shift between those those selves. And there's no other alternative for him. There's no uh, there's no other point. So you either either engage in this project or you don't. And uh, that that's his view. Um, and another thing he brings out is that this kind of project takes a lot of time. It's not it's not something you can do quickly. He says on page 69, analysts have learned some important lessons in the therapy of the individual about the limits of interpretation. Change requires time. The psyche, it seems, must consolidate each gain before another is undertaken with the aid of a process which we call working through. If this psychoeconomic element is disregarded and the psyche is instead exposed to demands for rapid changes, a surface adaptation will take place. The newly established function, although impressively strong at the moment, can only be maintained with continued effort. Um, So this actually, I like this point a lot, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Let's go back to the brain biology we, we discussed earlier. If you've spent, if anyone has spent, you know, 30, 40 years of life creating a certain hardwiring in your brain with, with the neurons and having certain thoughts repetitively and experiences repetitively that create sort of uh, those synapses and neurons in a certain form, it's, it obviously makes sense that you just can't uh, create a new hardwiring and new, new connections there within a day, week, or uh, perhaps even month or year. You know, if you're an adult, say you're 35 and 40 and you've been hardwiring your brain in a certain way for 35, 40 years, hour by hour, almost, you know, day by day, you keep having the same experiences and thinking the same thoughts, then it's, you can't, can't just, uh, you know, can't just, you know, um, overnight or quickly at all, you know, create a new, new hardwiring. It's going to take time and it's going to take, um, you know, uh, uh, I think COVID uses the uh, phrase consolidation of gains, which is a very, in the financial area, people understand what that means, and I think it it, it has some 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 you know residue here. You have to um, you know uh, progressively make gains and sort of uh, affirm them and then reaffirm them and and rework them out and and build on them. And, and I think that 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 has a lot of uh, uh, you know logical sense to it. Um, the third point Kohut makes that I really liked about self creation was that. Um, even as, and this again goes back to the, the gravity, the, cell, um, the uh, center of gravity examples we were using earlier with the planets and, and all those things. Um, and he says, basically he makes the point that even as the self is changing as a result of self-creation, there should still be some fixed, you know, some, some constants along the way, some, some core attributes that hold, you know, sort of the self together. And uh, for him, it's very, on a very broad level, these things are uh, these things are one uh, the presence of a sense of humor. Second, the the ability to respond to others with empathy and understanding. And third, um, you know, a sense of inner peace and serenity that you uh, that he calls sort of wisdom. And those things um, again, humor, empathy, and wisdom are sort of the core attributes of the self that sort of can be thought of as sort of a the self gravity that just kind of stays there constant while, while the self is still changing, um, and uh, I think those are probably pretty good ones there. To be honest, you know, um, humor is is probably a useful thing. Uh, very few people would have any problem with humor. I think um, empathy is important, obviously, and um, and, uh, and and wisdom, and, and obviously we've written all about uh, the importance of, of thinking and, and living. In accordance with wisdom, so uh, I think those are things that can stay while while uh, stay stable in the self, while uh, a lot of things are you know externally being tried and tested and experimented, and uh, new 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 avenues are sought. But that again, those things do not seem to be inconsistent with a changing self. Uh, sense of humor, sense of empathy, and wisdom. 
Um, now I want to disagree with one point with with Kohut. I want to think is kind of an important one, um, which is he said somewhere um, in one of the essays that uh, I think it's on the essay on leadership. He says um, basically uh, that, that we can't expect. Um, he says here it's actually on yeah on leadership page seventy one. Um, there is only a limited possibility for an expansion of the human capacity for humor, wisdom, creativity, and empathetic understanding. The transformation of narcissism into ideals and rational purposes can hardly achieve by large numbers. And I don't think that's true. I, I don't think um, self-creation and uh, humor and creativity and wisdom uh, are only achievable by some elite. I think, I think, uh, I think they're much more uh, generally achievable, I think they're probably achievable by, by everyone, um, as long as as long as um, they see the value of it um, and they see it as a real problem that they are not, uh, you know, getting creating a nuclear self or whatever term or self creating, and uh, they 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 are they are earnest to do so. Uh, I think then then that kind of thing can happen, but. But I think it's premature to say, uh, you know, it's not it's not achievable by most people. Uh, certainly, humor is is achievable by many. Uh, creativity of various forms can be broadly achievable. Um, and uh, and so I think uh, I think I would disagree on that point. So I think, in general, just to to wrap up, I think we can say that the self, to sort of summarize a lot of these points, this, the human self through a certain rewiring and reorientation of mind of the mind, um, has really, based on the mind's incredible power, um, incredible um, mm, uh, plasticity and incredible, basically, infiniteness, um, can constantly formulate and revise deferring standards of perfection over time. Uh, standards of perfection for a 10-year-old, for a 15-year-old, for a 25-year-old, for a 35-year-old, for a 45-year-old cannot be the same cannot be the same standard of perfection as you grow, cannot be the same standard even within perhaps, you know, shorter time periods than that. Um, you know, uh, even take an example of, you know, a cyclist, you know, someone that's starting cycling. Uh, the standard of what would be per perfection for the cyclist maybe in the first two months can be different from what's what would be, you know, uh, uh, perfection within a year or two years or three years. You know, it's different. Get more experiences, learn more about how to handle the road and, and uh, you know, train properly. You know, you're going to have a different standard over time of what, what would be perfection for that rider. And so perfection is not a fixed picture-like statuesque um, for human being, actually, for human being, human life. It's not, can't be static because uh, life's not static. Um, and uh, and so uh, the self, as it continues to formulate through the through the harnessing of the mind, uh, these deferring standards of perfection over time, uh, unique to each you know area of life and, and segment of life, does this, but but it has to do this, but at the same time during this activity, there has to be, I think, a the creation or the maintenance of a again a center of self gravity. That keeps it all sort of logical, keeps it all sort of um, you know cohere, cohesive in some form, um, and allows it to endure through all the changes that are happening. And very much like the Earth, that again constantly changes, constantly moves, constantly um, experiences different things, constantly sort of uh, experiences new forms of life. But yet, you can say there is definitely some constants on the Earth. And, and there are some constant. Uh, there is a center of gravity, and 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 finally, um, again, I don't know if uh, you can say whether most people are capable of this until most people try it. And I think until um, until we know that, until people try it, and we can't really say much more as to who is capable and who isn't. So, with that, I will uh, finish this post, and uh, I think we'll continue with. Uh, <laughs> The video for a bit here because it's uh, it's been uh, it's been uh, quite a while since I did video and I'm I'm enjoying it again. So talk to you soon. Bye bye. <clears throat>